Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here, and we're going to continue our series today called The Call, where we are talking about all of the horrible, impossible things Jesus asked us to do. And I say horrible, impossible, because if you haven't noticed, there are some things that Jesus asks us to do that literally seem downright impossible. He tells us to love our enemies. Who does that? That's so contrary to our nature. He tells us to forgive those who hurt us. That's not my natural tendency. My natural tendency is to get revenge. I wish Jesus would have said, when people come and poke you, poke them back twice as hard. (laughs) But he didn't say that. In fact, what he asked of us was really hard to do because it goes against everything that's within our nature and everything the world tells us was what we should do. He says, if somebody asks you to carry something for them, carry it twice as far as they ask you to carry them. And you go, what? That's insane. That's ridiculous. G.K. Chesterton, he once said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. When you really get into this faith, you discover the things that Jesus asks of you are very hard to do. And a lot of people end up bailing on this faith because he asks us things that are impossible to do in our own strength. He wants us to lean on his strength, like we talked about in that verse a minute ago, his strength for the power to do what he calls us to do, because what he calls us to do is actually kind of supernatural. It's something you're not going to do in your your nature. One of the things he talks about is something we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about the importance of humility. Now, I wrote a book about humility called How to Be Humble Like Me. That was a joke. (laughs) It's a total joke. But it is always awkward for a guy standing up here talking about humility because it's like, you know, you expect the pastor to know something about it. Now, I got to be honest. You know what my biggest problem is? I am an arrogant, arrogant individual. I'm one arrogant son of a gun. And so it is very hard sometimes. (laughs) Pride is a hard thing. and, And pride is such a fascinating thing because it shows up in lots of different ways in our lives. Pride can show up in not thinking right, like good, good about yourself. That's a form of pride. And pride can think about, come up as thinking too good about yourself. In fact, you know, they, they say that humility isn't making, thinking of yourself less. It's think, or excuse me, thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So we're going to talk this morning about how God calls us to a life of humility. And, you know, nothing can quite reveal pride in our lives as when somebody offends us. In fact, offense always reveals pride. And my dad did something recently that made me so mad. I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, Now, my dad, he's like my best friend besides my wife in the whole world. And I love my dad. But he said something recently that made me go, because it poked at my pride. So some of y'all know we've been working. My dad and I have been working on a retreat center out in Kerrville. And I've been building it. Um, like kind of by hand with a lot of help. And uh, we got to a point, it's been a year process. We've got four cabins that we've got built and they're almost ready to open. And Emily and I felt a few weeks ago, like we needed to actually move out to the property. We lived in San Antonio, but we decided to move out to Kerrville to the property to, to get this thing going, to get this project going. And uh, because things were just going so slow. So we moved out there. We sold our house, moved into an RV onto the property. And, all this, and then I got on the property and I started pushing. I was like, we got to get this fixed, get this done. I was calling contractors. I was calling ditch diggers. I was calling rock saw, people with rock saws. I was calling everybody. And things started moving really fast. And my dad showed up one day at the property and he goes, isn't it amazing how God's making all this stuff just work so fast? And I got mad. I said, you should have seen how slow things were going before God got me involved. <laughs> because things were not going fast. I had to get involved and I had to start kicking and pushing and punching. And it got me thinking about the ch- one of the challenges of pride is that sometimes our own sense of responsibility for things and our own ability to do things can quickly shift from a good thing into a bad thing when it turns into pride. And for me, I've discovered that it's shifted into a bad thing in my life. I'm I'm struggling with pride. When I I find myself asking this question, why why does it have to be so difficult? Have you ever had just a series of challenges in front of you? It's just like every door just keeps be slamming in your face. 
You look at your relationship with your son or your daughter and you go, why does it have to be so difficult? It used to be so easy. What happened on the path that caused things to get so offline? Why can't we just get along like we used to? Like, what happened? And why does it have to be so difficult? A mother and a daughter should get along well. A son and a father should get along well. Why does it have to be so difficult? Maybe your struggle is financial. Maybe you're going, man, why does it have to be so hard? Every time I think we're on top of it financially, I'm like, okay, we're going to have a month where we're going to come out and we're going to actually have more money in the bank uh, at the end of this month. And then boom, the tire blows or the engine burns out. And all of a sudden you've got this bill. And just when you thought you were going to get ahead, you're behind again. And you go, why does it have to be so difficult? You're looking at your business and man, you're just seeing every time you fill up that truck with fuel and you're going, Why does it have to be so expensive? Why does everything have to be so difficult? Why does it seem like the world is conspiring against us to make our life hard? Well, here's some news for you. Life is going to be hard. And one of the greatest challenges that many of us face, and I face this on a regular basis, is somewhere I got in my mind that life was supposed to be easy. But there's no promise of that anywhere in the Bible. In fact, Jesus says this. He says, in this world, you're going to have suffering. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So if you get in line with me, you get to overcome the world too. But it's not going to necessarily mean life's going to be a walk in the park. Now, I wish the way we won at life was by eating donuts and riding around on unicorns. (laughs) But that's not what he promises. Jesus says, hey, it's going to be hard. Just be honest with you. It's going to be hard. But this is where he comes in. He says something really powerful. He says this. He says, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened saying, why does it have to be so hard? Why is life so hard? Why am I so tired? Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and, there's that word, humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, what I think is interesting here. So if, if you know what a yoke is, a yoke is what they used to put between two oxen so that they could pull their, pull their weight. It's interesting that he says, you're still going to have to wear a yoke. Like there's still going to be a burden you're going to have to carry. But if you're trying to carry it all alone, you're going to get really tired because you're made to link up with me and we carry the weight together. You still got to carry a weight. In fact, this is my key, one of my first key points here. We all have a burden and responsibility to carry. You don't get out of life without having some burdens and responsibility. And it's hard. And you go, oh, you know, why is this happening to me? Well, it happens to everybody. Everybody's got their unique burden, your unique struggle. And one of the biggest dangers you can have is comparing your life to others and comparing your burden to theirs. You don't know what their burden is. How come they've got it so easy? Well, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. So you've got to stay focused on your burden. But he says, but look here, but if the weight seems oppressive, it's probably because we're trying to do it on our own. So when you start feeling exhausted and tired, it's a good chance that what you've done is you're taking on maybe a responsibility that should be yours, like you're carrying some weight, but maybe you're carrying more weight than you're actually supposed to instead of giving some of that weight to Jesus who says, hey, if you'll come to me and let me carry it with you, it'll be a lot easier. You still got to do the work. You still got to build the cabins, (laughs) but I'm going to make it a little bit easier for you as you show your willingness in faith, because look, look, faith, this is super important. Faith isn't sitting around wishing and hoping that things are going to be a certain way. Faith is taking action based on belief because you believe. I believe so much that God is going to do this, that I'm going to go ahead and start taking the steps. And it's like that activates something in God. When God sees, you know, an object in motion remains in motion, that's a principle God put in physics. It's also a spiritual principle. Oftentimes we have to take the step before we see that God's going to provide. And then God says, oh, he's serious. She's serious. All right, let me breathe in their direction. And I'm going to come and help with that. But if you're trying to do it on your own, you're going to get worn out and exhausted. You may be trying to carry this huge weight on your own by yourself. And first of all, it's awkward and clunky when it's made to be linked up with someone else. That's what Jesus is saying. If you'll come to me, I'll take some of that burden away. Now, what's really fascinating is, you know, when you're reading the Bible, it's always important to read the context of what you're reading and what Jesus says before and after he says this. And he talks about the fact that 
you know, you have a responsibility. You're going to have to carry a responsibility. And listen, sometimes for some of us, the message you need to hear is you need to take a little less responsibility for stuff that you have no control over. But for some of you, it's you need to step up and take responsibility for what you haven't taken responsibility for. The reason you're so miserable and, and, and frustrated right now is because you're not taking on responsibility. You're trying to make your life too easy by having no responsibility. And sometimes what you got to do is step up. And the reason everybody around you is angry and frustrated at you is because you're not taking responsibility. And sometimes you have to do it. So it's this balance of finding. You step up. And I, and I found the longer I walk with Christ, the more I've found that most answers aren't black and white. Most answers are yes and. For example, whose responsibility is it to build that retreat center out there? Well, it's God's. Yes, and I got to do the work. So much of, it, of life is yes and. It, it's not just black or white. It's yes, that's true, but this is also true because truth is very big. And so in your, you know, there's, Irenaeus said this, you've got to work as if it depends on you and pray as if it depends on God because both are true. And for some of you, you're working really hard and you haven't included Jesus in the picture. You go, why isn't it working? And I'm exhausted. Well, because you haven't included Jesus in your picture. You're trying to carry the yoke of life by yourself and it's not working well for you. For some of you, it's the opposite of that, right? You've been just sitting around waiting on God to deliver you, and he's like, I need you to do something. You got to step out in faith. God, deliver me from my financial situation. Well, have you read any books about how money works? Well, no, I'm just expecting you to deliver me, God. Well, read a book. Learn how a budget works. Budgets help a lot of things. It's fine balance. I would, I would venture to say for most people in here, we take too much responsibility and we end up carrying this weight we don't have to carry. So Jesus is talking about how pride can lead us sometimes to carry too much responsibility or pride can make us not carry enough responsibility. And so he, it, there's this it, interesting, if you read the verses preceding this, this is what the story goes. It says, Jesus, this whole sequence of where he says, come to me all who are wor- burdened and heavy, heavy laden. He starts off by saying, it says, Jesus began to denounce, he got mad at the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't change from their own ways. They wouldn't follow Jesus' ways. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. He said, If, if you would have had your like, eyes open to what I was actually doing instead of your own pride and ego, you would have seen there's some amazing things I just did, but you missed it. He says, but I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, this is Jesus' hometown. He says, will you be lifted to the heavens? He's basically saying, who do you think you are? You people in Capernaum, who do you think you are? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. He's basically saying, if the people in Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the miracles you just saw, the place never would have been burned up in fire. And I think the first thing Jesus is pointing out here is the danger of pride because pride will blind you. When you have so much pride in you, first of all, you've been around a very arrogant and proud person. They just miss really important cues. And when you're, when you're proud and you're arrogant and you're thinking you're all that, you will miss really important things going on in your family and it will eventually will humble you. Because disasters will befall you that you've chosen to ignore because in your pride, you don't want to acknowledge that that could be happening. And I see fathers who overlook things happening in their home all the time. They're like, well, rather than acknowledge, oh yeah, my family's falling apart because that would be a blow to their ego, they don't take any responsibility for it. And sure enough, everything blows apart in their family. And later they're like, what happened? And the fact was they ignored the warning signs because in their pride, they didn't want to acknowledge, oh, this is happening under my roof. And I need to do something about it. Because it makes how it makes you look, how it makes you feel uncomfortable. Oftentimes our pride will blind us to things. And, 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 and oftentimes God is at work doing something in your life. And the thing he's using to humble you, the financial situation, the relational situation, he's wanting to use that for you to lean on him. But instead in your pride, you just puff yourself up and say, I'm going to figure this out on my own. And listen, this is a real challenge because we live in a very individualistic society. And on top of that, we live in Texas. 
And we Texans, we're like, we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're going to do this, man. We're going to do that. I got my big boy boots on. I can handle this like a man. And then, and then you end up destroying your life trying to do it on your own. And you end up worn out, tired, and beat up. And you're going, what's going on? And Jesus is like, if you would have just linked up with me, I could have made things go a lot better for you. So he's saying, be careful, because pride can blind you. So then Jesus goes on. And this is weird what Jesus says next. You're like, what does this have to do with what Jesus said before him? But there's a connection here, okay? It's all leading up to him talking about, come and learn from me because I'm humble. He says, Jesus said, I praise you, Father. So he's praying out loud. And it sounds like a really arrogant prayer, what he says, but it, it, ain't, it ain't arrogant if you can back it up, right? I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. You know, there are certain things in life that we can just get educated beyond intelligence on. We see that in our world today. We have so many educated people who are just stupid. Let's be honest. They're not wise. You can educate yourself beyond intelligence. And a little kid can see. You remember the, the, remember the, uh, the book, The Emperor's New Clothes? And everyone's saying, the emperor, like, everyone knows the emperor's naked, but nobody wants to say anything about it. And it's finally a kid that goes, the emperor's naked. And everybody's like, ah, oh, the emperor is naked. Sometimes it takes just like getting rid of all of like the, the humility of a little child to see things as they really are. He's like, thank you, God, that you've revealed these complex things oftentimes to children better than you have to us educated adults. We have to get like the, like the mind of a child sometimes to see the reality of who Jesus is. And he says, and you've revealed the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And things is interesting because, you know, he says learn from me. And, you know, you can't learn without a little bit of humility because humility says, there's something I don't know. I know there's something I don't know. And when you've got humility, you're, well, you're, you're open to learning. But you know who never learns is people who are proud and say, I know all there is to know. And they live in a world about this big. And anything outside of that world makes them uncomfortable or they ignore the facts. But humility recognizes there's a whole lot of stuff I don't know. And here's the really important thing. What you don't know is way more important than what you do know. What you don't know can kill you. So you've got to recognize at any given point in this life, no matter how much you learn and how much you know, humility recognizes there's a whole lot I don't know. And what I don't know is way more important than what I do know. So I'm going to stay open and teachable and I'm going to learn. And here's what Jesus is saying, I think. He was saying, he's, he's talking about his identity in, in Christ. He says, God, I know you sent me down here for a specific purpose. I know who I am. I know who you are. I'm going to stay within my role. I'm going to walk in the confidence in that role. And I think what he's saying here is this. Humility is having a right perspective of yourself and knowing your right place. So let's first talk about having a right perspective of yourself. A few years ago, I decided I was going to get really buff and ripped at the gym. I started going, and within two days, I was like super buff. I went to, I, every time I'd go stand in front of that mirror and lift up those barbells, I'd be like, Dang, man, look at this. This is incredible. But the weirdest thing happened. Between the time I got from the, went to the gym back home, I came home and there was a, a mirror that greeted me at home. And every time I'd get home, I lost all my muscle. <laughs> like, what is going on? I started doing some research and I discovered that in front of that big barbell set at the gym, they have a magnifying mirror. So that your muscles look a little bit bigger and it keeps you coming back until you get home and see nothing's really changed. <laughs> That's one side of pride. One side of pride is puffing yourself up to be a little more important, a little bigger of a deal than you think you are. But you know, there's another side of pride. You know, on the other side of the gym, the ladies' side of the gym, in front of the weights, they had a skinnying mirror because girls all want to be skinny and guys all want to be buff, right? There's another thing where you can downplay what you are. And you can actually, in pride, make yourself too important because you're belittling what God made. And every one of us in this room here, you've got something about you that you don't like. Maybe it's your personality. You wish you were a little more 
smooth or eloquent or you wish you were a little more outspoken or you wish you were a little bit more quiet. We've got a burden to carry, right? Maybe it's something about your physical body and your appearance. You're like, how come that guy can eat or that girl can eat anything she wants? And I'm living off of carrots over here and I'm still gaining weight. Like, and there's all, we've all got parts of us that we don't like. And the Apostle Paul, he talks about this in Romans. He says this. He says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? I think every one of us at some point, we've looked at something about ourselves and we feel limited because of a way God made us. It's something unchangeable. Like you just can't change your body type. It is what it is. You just can't change your personality and temperament. It is what it is. You're like, I wish I was more driven, but I'm just not, right? And look, you can develop some of that. But by nature, for example, Emily, my wife, she is a very peaceful, calm temperament. And sometimes she's like, I wish I could get more done. But when she starts to get stuff done, I don't like being around her. All the peace leaves the room. I'm like, I I like her peaceful nature. And she's like, I wish I did more. But, you know, that's a gift she brings to the world, right? And me, I'm not a peaceful person. I wish I could be a little more peaceful. I'm up at night freaking out about all sorts of stuff and worried about what doors I got to kick open and who's going to take advantage of me, right? I'm, I'm paranoid. I'm a paranoid freak. Some of that's a gift. Some of it's stuff I got to develop. But <laughs> doesn't the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? There are certain things about who you are that you've just got to acknowledge that that is who you are. And yes, it's yes and. Yes, I acknowledge that there's I'm not talking about sin here, okay? If you've got sin in your life, you need to get rid of that. But I'm talking about your temperament, your personality, by nature who you are, your physical attributes, some of those things. You're just going to have to come to grips with who God made you to be and learn to lean into who he made you to be and stop complaining to God. God, I can't do what I'm called to do because I don't have X or Y or Z. And humility is recognizing I am who I am, and apparently God made me this reason, way for a purpose. Throughout my life, I've been outspoken. I spent many, many, many hours in the principal's office in, in middle school, elementary, middle school, and high school because of things I had said. My dad used to say, every time he'd come to the principal and bail me out, he'd say, you know, that gift of outspokenness of yours is going to be a true gift one day if I don't kill you before you get there. <laughs> And, you know, I try and be docile and quiet and not speak up, but it just flows out of me. Like, if something's not right, I just say it. And sometimes Emily would be like, why did you have to say something? I'm like, I can't not do it. It just happens. And look, I've had to learn to temper it, right? You temper your gift. You learn how to use it correctly. But by nature, I'm outspoken. And, I, and, and when I use that correctly, as God calls it to be, it's a gift. But sometimes I wish I just didn't have to speak up about certain things. And I'm learning what to balance. But my point is this, there's something in you that's natural to you, and you go, man, God, I wish you wouldn't have made me this way, but who are you to say, why did you make me this way? Humility is recognizing you are the way you are for a purpose. It's recognizing what you are, and it's recognizing what you aren't. Coming to grips with it and being okay with it, and recognizing that what you are must be for a purpose. He made you the way you are for a purpose. And there's a burden with it, no doubt. We all have a burden to carry with everything about us. But humility recognizes that it was your creator who put that in you. So who are you to question what he did? He made you that way for a reason. Again, I'm not talking about sin. If there's sin in your life, get rid of that. I'm talking about those unchangeable temperamental things that you struggle with. I think that's the first step. And then the second step is this. Knowing your right place. And one of the biggest challenges in knowing your right place is usually figuring out who do you need to be in submission to. Now, this word, I don't like it. I hate the word submission. I don't want to submit to anybody. I want to be the author of my own destiny. But the first step in becoming a Christian is submitting your will to God's will. And then the outflow of that is submitting to others. And there's a, listen, there's a safety. Submission to authority offers a layer of protection and power. It's like an umbrella That if you've got an umbrella over you, it just protects you from the rain. But a lot of times, what happens is we want to get out from under the umbrella. And we want to do our own thing. And then we wonder why the storms of life are beating us up. 
And if we would just surrender and submit to the authorities that God has put into our life, spiritual authorities, work authorities, things might go a lot easier for you. I worked for a long time at our church. There was a homeless guy, a wonderful guy. He was one of our best workers. And uh, he wasn't necessarily a Christian. He became a Christian eventually. But uh, one day I was like, man, let me get you a house to live in. He's like, I don't want to live in a house. I said, why not? He's like, man, then they'll know where I am. I'm like, who's they? He's like, the government. I was like, well, first of all, bro, I'm going to have to write you a 1099 at the end of the year, and it's going to have an address on it. So they're going to know where you live. But he's like, no, I don't want nobody to know where I am. But he was always complaining about how hard his life was. And I thought it was interesting that he had chosen to not submit himself to anyone. He wanted to be a free lone ranger. But he was always complaining about how hard life was. And I kind of wonder if maybe if he would have just come and submitted under some authority, let some people take care of him a little bit, like, we wanted to get him a house, and finally he did. He said, all right, you can give me a house. We got him a place to live behind the church. And he slowly, but every once in a while, he just, he just disappeared because he got mad because he didn't want to submit to anybody. He'd disappear and yell at me, and then he'd come back three weeks later, and I'm sorry, man, and I'd give him his job back because he was a really good worker. But he made his life so hard because he just refused to submit to anyone. And, you know, sometimes in our marriages, we make our marriage a lot harder than it needs to be because we refuse to submit to one another. You know, we use the verse in the Bible that always says, you know, wives, submit to your husbands. Men love that verse. (laughs) Yeah, man, make that woman submit. Get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich. It doesn't work that way. It's mutual submission. In fact, fact, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians in this, he says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own own advantage. Remember that, that, that talk earlier that Jesus gave? He said, God, I thank you that you know who I am. I know who you are. You sent me to direct people to you. Like, I know who I am. He, but he's saying, Jesus knew he was God in the flesh, but he didn't use it as something to his own, own advantage. He was humble. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He surrendered himself, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. And listen, I know this. Some of us, we've had so much pride in our heart for so long that actually submitting to someone might feel like death. Submitting to the idea, the idea of submitting to your spouse, mutually submitting, the idea of submitting to your husband or your wife may feel like death. You say, I shouldn't, why should I submit to them? They don't even deserve it. And this is where Jesus's difficult call comes in. He says, you've got to submit yourselves one to another. Even if they don't deserve it, you submit because of the position they're in. And I have seen marriages restored when men and women choose to submit to each other rather than having their own way and their pride. And he's not going to tell me what to do. She's not going to want to tell me what to do. And I'm telling you, this is a mutual thing. There have been so many times in my life and married to Emily that I have gotten bailed out. Like I'll, I'll, many times where I've won example, where I wanted to confront somebody, which I'm really good at. Man, I can confront on a dime. Just put them in front of me and I'll confront. <laughs> and Emily will oftentimes go, that's not a good decision. And if I go, well, I don't care what you say, woman, get in the, get in the kitchen to make me a sandwich. <laughs> I'm going to pay the price <laughs> in many ways. The other day, there was something that I, I, I was like, Emily, we got to do this now. And she's like, I don't think this is a good time. And I was like, no, we got to do it now. She's like, no, I really don't think it's a good time. I'm like, I'm doing it. Get in the car. <laughs> More or less, that's what I said. And we did the thing. And three days later, I realized what a stupid decision I had made. And I was like, Emily, you were right. And had I not had that pride thing in me that said, oh, I know what I'm doing. I know what I didn't listen to. I wasn't going to listen to her. It would have saved me a lot of gas money because we ended up spending a lot of gas money on what the situation was. We've got to submit to one another. That's what it says here. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus submitted himself to his Father, glory came. And in your life, maybe the thing you need to do is stop trying to figure it out on your own and submit to the people God has put in your life and the the input that they want to give you 
the insight they want to give you, and you're like, I'm going to figure it out on my own. I like to learn. I've heard people brag about how they like to learn things the hard way. I'm like, well, that's why you look the way you do, right? Because <laughs> you've been beating your head against the wall so many times. Humble your freaking self. Recognize God's put people around you that might be able to help you not beat your head against the wall anymore. But it takes going, man, Lord, I want to learn how to be humble because by nature, I'm proud. I want to figure it out on my own. And the question you always got to ask is, I always ask people this when they tell me their lofty opinions. I'm like, well, how is that working out for you? And usually it's not working out very good. So you got to ask right now, how has it been working out for you? Living out of your own pride and ego and always having to be right, never admitting you're wrong. How's the relationship with the kids like that when you've never admitted you're wrong and apologized? How's that going? How's the relationship with your spouse? Is she still living in the apartment out there? Can't get her to come home? How's it working out? Humble yourself. I asked my dad one time, I said, Dad, can you humble yourself or does God have to do it? And he said, well, you can have it either way. But if you do it yourself, it's a lot less painful. That's where it says here in James, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. When you humbly admit, again, it's not, I'm a worm, I'm nothing. No, it's recognizing what's your responsibility to carry and what's his to carry. And, don't, and it's a constant balancing act. Sometimes what you're responsible for, you end up starting to take more of it, make more, take more control of it. Like when I, when I know I'm getting stressed out and, and doing too much is when I, when I feel like I'm, I'm taking control of everything and I'm exhausted. And every time invariably throughout the time with this retreat center, I'll be trying to get hold of a contractor, right? For like three weeks. And I'm so mad. Sometimes I'm trying to save God money. You ever had that? You try and save God money. You're like, God, I'm trying to save you money here. Why aren't you letting me do this? And I'll finally go, that's it. I'm done. I give up. And then five minutes later, the contractor will call. There's something about all of a sudden surrendering to the fact that you can't do this on your own. And then God's like, you going to let me link up with you here and let me carry this burden that you can't carry on your own? So I guess my message this morning is give up. Give up all hope. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but in some ways, there is an element, yes and. Yes, you need to give up on trying to get everything through your own power, your own ability to manipulate your own smarts and your own intelligence. Now I'm going to manipulate and control over here and surrender yourself and say, Lord, I got a lot to learn. Come, link up. Let me link up with you because you said your burden is light. I still got a burden to carry. We all got a burden to carry. You're not getting out of that. But if you link up with him and carry your part and let him carry his part, life goes a lot easier and you go further, faster. There's an African proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And the long game depends on us linking up with Jesus and letting him pull it, help us pull that weight. Humble yourselves before the Lord that he may lift you up in due time. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you came and were an example of humility. You being in very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to your advantage, but you surrendered and humbled yourself. And then you said, come and learn from me. Let me show you what humility looked like. It's knowing your right place. It's knowing you're standing before God. It's knowing what you are and what you aren't. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to walk in that freedom and you take away that heavy burden off of our shoulders. I pray for anyone this morning that's been carrying a heavy burden. I pray that they would just surrender that to you, Lord, what they've been trying to carry that wasn't theirs to carry. Give it to you. And we just believe that you're going to make that, you're going to come through with your promise that your yoke is easy, your burden is light. First step in this whole process, if you haven't done this yet, is humbling yourself before God and recognizing you can't live your life without him. So we're going to say a prayer in a second. If you want to, if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God's going to forgive all your sins and then he's going to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And he's going to link up with you and he's going to start to carry that weight for you. So if you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, Jesus is going to come and transform you. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources in the back there. Linda can give you some resources. You guys can stand. I pray that you guys will walk out of here with your head held high, humbly, and live, live out of confidence that God is for you. He's walking with you. He wants to carry that weight for you. Be blessed. Have a great week.
If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>